All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you, everybody, for joining us this, this morning, and um, thanks for your patience with our early start there. My name is Christian Davies, and I'm the Gene Jones Director of Public Programs here at the Nevada Museum of Art. And I'd like to welcome you to a virtual art bite today with Lori Rodriguez. Um, today's program is Lori Rodriguez in the language of cartography. Um, Lori has multiple works on view at the Nevada Museum of Art as part of the In the Flow exhibition curated by Vario and Joanne Northrup, which is on view now at the Nevada Museum of Art. Today's Art Bite lecture ser uh, series is supported by Nevada Humanities with additional sponsorship and free admission for students supported by the Core Humanities program at the University of Nevada, Reno, and we thank them for their support and helping to make this possible. Uh, a couple of bits of housekeeping is you'll notice the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen with two speech bubbles. Use that to get your questions in. After Lordy's presentation, he'll be, we'll be taking some questions and having a little bit of discussion. Um, also feel free to drop your name in the chat. Let us know where you're watching from. And with that, I'd like to go ahead and introduce Joe Ed Northrup uh, to bring on our, our featured guest today. Hi, Joe, Joe Ed. Hi everyone, thank you for being here with us today. I'm Joanne Northrup and I'm the Curatorial Director and Curator of Contemporary Art at the Nevada Museum of Art. And I organized the exhibition In the Flow that features Lordi Rodriguez's work from our permanent collection. And just a, a, a note about that, um, for those of you who have had the opportunity to come to the museum and see the exhibition, it recently opened and it's going to be on view through the end of the year. So I hope you'll get into the museum in person. Um, but Lordi Rodriguez's work actually inspired the, the title of the exhibition and sort of the concept. Um, when I was able to speak with him about his practice as an artist and how he gets into the flow and creates a large body of work so quickly when normally works take him a lot longer. So I think that's a very, um, I'm very happy to have him here today because he's sort of the representative for that exhibition. So Lordi Rodriguez was born in 1976, the Philippines, raised in Louisiana and Texas and currently lives and works in Benicia, California. He obtained his BFA degree from the School of Visual Arts in New York and his MFA from Stanford University. For several years, he's been working on a series of ink drawings that critically look at the effect visual languages have had on culture and identity through the use of mapping and cartography. His recent exhibitions include, in the flow, <laughs> of course, um, very, very recent is an exhibition. He has a solo exhibition opening at Todd Hosfeld Gallery in San Francisco titled Polar Democracy, opening on October 17th through November 25th. Really excited to see that. Um, before that, some of you may have seen his work in Tahoe, A Visual History at the Nevada Museum of Art, which was in 2015. The map as art at the Kemper Museum in St. Louis, Missouri in 2012, Code Switch, and the map is not the territory at Hosfeld Gallery in New York in 2013 and 2011, respectively. Optimism in the Age of Global War, the 10th annual Istanbul Biennial in Istanbul, Turkey in 2007, and the California Biennial in Orange County, at the Orange County Museum of Art in Newport Beach, California, in 2006. He has some very cool recently completed public art projects, including works for the San Francisco Arts Commission at the San Francisco International Airport, General Services Administration at Land Port of Entry Immigration Federal Facility in New Mexico. And this is the one I'm excited about, the Facebook headquarters at Event Space Lobby in downtown San Francisco. Congratulations on that, Lordy. And with that, I'd like to turn this over to artist Lordi Rodriguez. Thank you for being here with us. Thank you, um, Joanne, uh, for that wonderful introduction. Um, and thank you, Christian, for, um, for having me here today uh, to speak about my work um, with your audience and with the, the museum. It's, um, you know, I just, before I start, I just wanted to say that it's really important that um, the, the relationship between the artist and, and the museum and um, 
later on with some of the newer works, I'll show you a result of one of those um, relationships. Um, so the first slide I wanted to start off with everybody is uh, a, a fairly representative piece of a whole series of work that I started in 1996. And um, it took about 10 years to complete. I finished it in 2006. And this was a My America series. Um, what you're seeing here is a, a kind of like a key map of the whole series. Uh, this is a reconstructed version of the United States that I made uh, based off of my history and relationship here um, with this country. Um, you know, uh, Joanne had mentioned that I grew up in Louisiana and Texas, but then I also had relatives in various uh, regions around the country. And trying to um, assimilate, um, or actually when you're a kid, you're, you're not just assimilating, you just, you're just accepting this into your own person um, like every other kid, um, but taking in um, regional identities like in the East Coast or in California and then adding that on top of being from Louisiana and Texas, um, growing up wondering what, what is American culture was very confusing for me because I saw such a large diverse culture. It wasn't uh, monolithic at all. So um, to understand my place in this culture, I created, I started the series when I was in undergraduate school. Um, and I reconstruct, um, I reconstruct the United States and each state that you see here is its own individual drawing. Um, so there's about 56 drawings um, in the whole series. But um, you're, you're thinking that 56, but every state you made a drawing. So what are the extra six drawings? Well, this one you're looking at is the six, uh, would be the 56th one, but there, there's a five extra ones. And I did create extra uh, five extra states um, for um, my version of the United States. Um, the five states are places that have some sort of sovereignty associated with it, but it's not a real place. Um, so Disney World is a state. Um, Hollywood is a state. Um, uh, monopoly, which is uh, supp supposed to be a metaphor for the business world, and then territory state, which is a state that, I'm um, sorry, internet, which is uh, the, inter the state of internet, which is right in the middle, you can see right in the center of the country, and then uh, territory state, which was a state that had all the places that America has occupied over its history, which includes the Philippines. Um, so I just wanted to um, start off with this piece to see where I began. Now, because we're um, Virtually, we could be anywhere, but because we're, I'm speaking out of the Nevada Art Museum, I just wanted to show um, Nevada from um, that uh, series. I'm really sorry, it's not a really great image, but um, it, it's, it's a much older piece. As you can see, it's in 2004, and I think digital images were so great back then. But um, here you can see that um, I made Nevada, or I kept Nevada as a landlocked state, but you guys kind of look like Arizona now. But um, I thought I'd just share with that uh, share that one with you. Which brings us um, to um, the small drawing series, which is included um, in the flow exhibit. Um, right after I finished the America series, um, I started this body of work. Uh, I, I, I'm sure, as most of you can relate, when you finish something. Uh, very large or important, um, a block can easily happen. And I was in graduate school at the time and I was experimenting with a lot of different ideas. Um, but I, I needed to find a way to rediscover my relationship to the map and what can come out of it. So I started this series, and I think being in um, being in an exhibit called "In the Flow" is such a wonderful metaphor for this particular body of work, uh, because I wanted to kind of get past a certain barrier of uh, the America series, and I didn't want to only just be uh, known for that body of work. I really wanted to push certain borders and, and boundaries. And that's when this body came around, this body of work came around. 
I approached it as a way, I, I approached it as a linguist would approach understanding a new language. Visual, uh, uh, maps are a visual language. And I tried to apply some certain um, uh, uh, techniques in linguistics to try to understand my visual language. So what I did was I itemized my alphabet. Um, I, I looked at a lot of individual visual elements within the work within the America series and a couple of other abstract um, uh, pieces I did that, um, uh, prior to this series. And I just laid them all out. In the beginning, there was about 70 small drawings and all of these drawings are 10 by 14 inches. They're all the same. So um, I, I don't have to um, get distracted too much by uh, different compositional um, challenges. And after 70 or so, this uh, series became a platform to expand upon that language. And you could see here, these are um, nine drawings from that series, but much later on uh, in the series for, um, compared to the pieces that are currently in the show. And you can see a, a there's more expand. The language is definitely expanded, but it's expanded to include um, you know, stripes. You see circles. Sometimes some pieces, for example, maybe the piece on the lower left-hand corner, that yellow one. Perhaps by itself, you wouldn't associate that with a map. And there are certain. There's definitely examples within this whole series where. Uh, take them out of this context, they, you would never see them as a map. But because you see them within this grid of other map-like drawings, then perhaps it takes on some of those characteristics. And um, that was also a very interesting thing to discover along the way. Color has the same um, characteristic um, or effect. When you put orange within uh, 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 let's say a matrix of all these different kinds of browns, orange will start to look brown. Uh, same thing with a lot of different colors. If you look at the work at, uh, uh, look at the work of Joseph Albers and how he's combining various colors of, um, colors of squares on top of each other and um, how he plays with the relativity of color, um, that was a major lesson um, that I took from his work and applied to, to this, but instead of just color, it's the relativity of the content. Uh, so something that may not look map-like becomes map-like later on because of the uh, context that you put it in. Um, just really, really quickly, I just wanted to uh, share with you that these are drawings. Um, these are all hand-drawn drawings, and I um, use, uh, these are an example of one of my markers. I use Copic uh, markers. What's really great about these practically is that I refill them uh, with these, um, with these refillable inks. So, um, yeah, as you can guess, some of these graphic design markers get pretty expensive, but these refills are much cheaper. And um, it'd be very wasteful to be, you know, throwing away a whole marker um, after you're done with it. So it's really great that I can refill it. Uh, but uh, these are alcohol-based inks. And when you have alcohol-based inks um, applied to a fairly porous paper, like the paper I'm using, which is a printmaking paper, you could get really, really smooth surfaces because the, when the alcohol, since the alcohol evaporates so quickly, what's left is the pigment um, and it dries very smoothly. And this was very important. This is a very important effect that I needed to get because um, maps have their own history and art has its own history and they don't always intersect. Um, and somehow I have to address both of those um, in, in this work. Um, maps were first hand drawn, then they became um, printed after a while, and now they're digital. So we've had we've seen many permutations of map over the history of over his, its history. Um, but the relationship that we have when we look at older maps 
is different than the relationship that we have now with, let's say, digital maps. Uh, we don't approach it, an antique map with the need for the utility that's embedded in maps. We look, we have a tendency, or I do at least, have a tendency to look at antique, map, antique maps more aesthetically. That way I can forgive the mistakes a lot more. Um, and there, there, there are a lot, but that's not what I'm there for. I'm not there for accuracy. I'm there for the aesthetics. As opposed to digital maps, um, I'm not necessarily there for aesthetics, although I totally do enjoy the aesthetics of digital maps, but um, I'm there for the utility of it. And so there's that strange um, approach when it comes to maps, depending on if they're old or uh, new maps. And that's something I like to take advantage of because I'm trying to use such a, an aesthetic that's so printed that I'm trying to, in a sense, gain your trust in the same way a digital map would gain your trust um, instead of just focusing on just the aesthetics. Although what I end up doing with it is totally being uh, disregarding uh, or disregarding certain, uh, certain kinds of information in favor of others. So that was sort of the discovery um, along the way when working with this uh, body of work. That's why in the flow is such a great metaphor because it, it had led to a deluge of other ideas. Um, so one of those ideas that came out of this body of work is to incorporate uh, different kinds of visual languages on top of the current visual language that I'm working with, which is cartography. Um, this is a, 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 an example uh, from a small series that I did called the Strangerhood series. Um, and the Strangerhood series consists of six drawings of six different neighborhoods in San Francisco that have either gone through for, um, have either gone through gentrification or are currently going through the process of gentrification and the effects of that. Uh, all six of these drawings are currently permanently installed at, um, at the uh, San Francisco airport. Um, if you ever find yourself in the Terminal 2 with the United Wing and the baggage claim and you see the Starbucks, you could turn around and the installation is right behind you. Um, but this is an example of, uh, uh, one of one from the series called Fisherman's Wharf. I, I brought one that um, if, if anyone has been to the uh, Bay Area, you've probably been to Fisherman's Wharf. But these are, what, what, what I did was I took a walk in each of these neighborhoods and I took pictures of every single piece of text, pattern, um, anything that I could find. The word strangerhood um, was denoting the role of the stranger coming into a neighborhood. Places like Fisherman's Wharf, there are residents that live there, yes. Um, but the neighborhood is tailored for the stranger. Um, and as, as opposed to other neighborhoods that, um, that, are, that aren't and their visual languages are totally different. Um, so, for example, if you see that red and white checkered pattern somewhere on the bottom half, um, that pattern isn't totally unique to Fisherman's Wharf. You've probably seen it before at um, uh, carnivals or fairs. It's usually that kind of pattern that you see on the uh, to-go uh, container for food. Um, it's usually like a square. Um, but those are the those are the containers that the very well known clam chowder bowl comes in. But when you walk around Fisherman's Wharf, you'd be able to find any of these um, patterns. And what this becomes, it becomes a portrait of the neighborhood during that moment that I was taking a walk around that neighborhood. Um, Fisherman's Wharf, most of those are still there, but other neighborhoods, like I, I did with, for example, like the Mission. Um, which is a uh, very, very fast uh, changing neighborhood. A lot of the patterns that I use for that piece are no longer there. And such is the nature of maps. They are very temporal. And it's um, sometimes it's 
great or sometimes it's sad to see certain, some of those changes or those losses. Um, now I wanted to share with you um, the, some new works um, that are included in my uh, solo show opening at Hosfeld Gallery um, this weekend um, called Polar, the show is called Polar Democracy and polar as not as in the polar ice, ice caps, but polar as in, in opposition of two forces. And when I would think about the America series, um, that uh, first piece that I showed you in the beginning as a way to understand how I fit into this country culturally. These two bodies of works um, I'm sure I'm going to share with you. I suppose were a way for me to understand how I fit in this country as a citizen. These two bodies of works are uh, based off of gerrymandered districts and the other is based off of protests and marches. Two things that I would say are part of the same coin, I suppose, um, where your, your voice as a citizen is your power and that power can be diminished um, if you live in a gerrymandered district because your vote is, um, doesn't have as much weight as compared to other congressional districts in your state because that's the way it was devised. Um, and the, on the other side of that is when we feel like, or when, we are, when our vote, our voice through our vote is not um, counted, then we go and protest. Um, and I really was enthralled by this polarity between um, gerrymandering and um, protest. <coughs> Excuse me. This first piece I'm showing you is uh, the Maryland's third congressional district. Um, it's the only uh, piece from the series where I actually changed the orientation of the, the, the district. Um, it, it's, it's actually, so right now, uh, sorry if I'm <laughs> using my hand as an example, right now you're kind of seeing it like that, but if you can imagine turning it like this, where this is that open part of the, um, the middle part of that city area. That's the actual orientation. And this is where Baltimore is. And one of the, the island area you see in the lower right hand um, area would be where Annapolis would be. So there's um, all of these different neighborhoods all being represented as one. Um, and this, there is no way that you could look at the shape and think of it as one city. It seems so spread out and thinned out. Um, and that was the, I, I, that was the effect that I wanted to get with this piece. Also, um, source in terms of source material, um, source sources are always really important with my work. And the reason why I did change the orientation is because I saw um, a cartoon logo um, that um, a cartoonist took of this shape and turned it into, I think it was like a cowboy um, cartoon. So you could see it's like a, a weird cartoon with two long legs coming out of it. Uh, this is uh, Texas's second uh, congressional district. Um, I, like, I, um, like Joanna mentioned earlier, I, I grew up in Louisiana and Texas. And in Texas, I grew up in Houston. Um, technically, this district is not the district I lived in. I lived in Al Green's district. This is Dan Crenshaw's district. Um, but I, I know a lot of these different, I, lo I know a lot of these neighborhoods in, in this district. And um, I went to school, high school in downtown Houston. So I spent a lot of time where th this district is. Um, and Houston kind of grows in a ring pattern. It, it grows out and to see this weird shape circumvent just the outer skirts of the um, of the downtown area and the inner loop. If any of you are familiar with Houston, that's what they would call it, the inner loop. Um, it doesn't, just like with Maryland, makes absolutely no sense. It's a crazy and ridiculous shape. Um, but 
one thing, one metaphor that I started to use with this body of work, as you can see in the background, um, all of this, these squares and this grid, and the colors are chosen randomly. So what I would do is um, in my color system, I have three, 355 colors and I assigned, to the, I assigned each one of those colors a number. Um, and let's say for the drawing you see in front of you, I, I would need about 500 or 600 um, different colors. So I would run, um, uh, run a random number generator um, of 600 uh, numbers within the frame of one to 35. And then I would get a list of numbers. And from that list, I, I, um, um, I had a program built that translates those numbers into the color, the number system that's used for Copics, because they're not, they're num they're not, they're numbered differently. Like these, this one is E19. So E19 is, let's say if this was, E19 was 254, um, I would, before, I would have to, you know, look at 254 and then find it on my list, which, which color 254 is, and I'll find out it'd be E19 and I'd write it down. Doing it by hand took forever, but um, after um, having this program made, um, I could print out uh, thousands and thousands of numbers fairly quickly now. Um, and the metaphor with using random colors is that the law or perhaps um, the government's um, treatment of its citizenship should be applicable to any random person, not to a specific class. And gerrymandering votes or gerrymandering districts to control certain votes changes that scale where one voice is um, stronger than another and therefore it's no longer random. Um, so I do employ, even though I do employ the randomness, I still took on certain um, um, characteristics that gerrymandering does by controlling the pool of colors um, that I'm, I'm pulling from. So for example, you see this triptych of Texas is second in the middle are all 355 colors um, um, randomly applied. But on the left side um, are all the dark colors. And then um, I would randomly pull from that. And on the right side, I got all the light colors and I randomly pulled from that set. And then and that's how you end up with this configuration. This is um, North Carolina's 12th district. Um, just to give you an idea, this is four different versions of North, North Carolina's 12. The current version you don't see here. Um, if you're familiar with North Carolina, um, you see the bottom part of each one of those districts would be around where the border is with North Carolina and South Carolina. And then when you go further up that shape, somewhere near the top, you start um, hitting um, Charlotte. Um, so I had mentioned I lived in um, close to Texas's second. My mother actually lives in um, uh, North Carolina's 12th district. And it turns out a majority of the gerrymandered districts that I, I used um, for the show were places that I had lived or where a lot of my relatives have lived. Um, and I, I was wondering, I don't know if this is true. I mean, I don't know if there, this was conscious, um, but I, I came to the United States in the 70s and there was a large um, population of um, um, uh, Filipinos um, and also a, a huge population of Asians in general coming to the United States in the 70s and not all of them had um, settled on either coast uh, the interior of the country started getting um, uh, settled as well, and a lot, and that's where a lot of those gerrymandered districts are. And I was wondering, and I, um, I, I, either discovering some sort of weird truth that perhaps my very typical story, this very typical narrative that um, I have in my life, is um, 
uh, play it out with all, a whole bunch of other um, immigrants and ending up in heavily gerrymandered districts, whether or not there's a connection to that. I'm, I'm sure there is. It, it makes perfect sense to me. But um, uh, with this one, the I'm thinking about the evolution of this particular district. And um, I'm, even though the colors are randomized, ran, randomized the, the application of the colors um, are also kind of trying to push or insinuate that as this district is evolving, that there is some sort of resolution, that it starts off with a very disparate application. And slowly and slowly, as you head further right, um, then it becomes solid. And when you see the, um, the final shape of um, North Carolina's 12th, it, it's a perfectly reasonable shape to represent a community. This is um, the Bataan Death March, um, which was a march of soldiers during World War II of both Filipino um, soldiers and um, American soldiers. Um, right now, there, I mean, there's only been estimates of how many were killed on this march. Um, around 600 or so Americans and around 20,000 or so Filipinos. Um, and the, um, the purple route that you see here is the Bataan Death March, the actual one. Um, and one of the towns that it stops at, um, somewhere around the middle of the march, uh, stops at a town called Guagua. Um, and I, I never knew this until I was doing research on this, that um, because Guagua was the um, town that my family's from. And uh, there's a central square um, through town um, that the soldiers had marched through. And that square, right at the corner of it, is the entrance to my family's um, you know, like family compound, um, and to be strangely connected to something that um, happened in history was very, very jarring. Um, so when I was doing my research on, um, on Bataan, I um, also came across uh, a memorial march um, that happens every, I think every year, um, where you have a, a whole bunch of um, uh, uh, people from the military going on this march um, in honor of um, a lot of the survivors from that march that are still around. Um, but then it's also evolved to become a marathon because it's, uh, it's 20, the memorial march is 26 something miles long, which is the length of a marathon, I, I think. And then um, the Bataan Death March is much longer than that. I, I think it was around 80 miles. But um, uh, I wanted to superimpose the two of them on top of each other. And the background is uh, using um, our, a randomized pattern, a randomized set of colors. But that set all pulls from the red. Um, red, be, I don't know if the red was necessarily meant to represent blood or anything like that. Um, but there is something of the, the violence of that color or could be interpreted within that color. Um, and it was, the first, it was the first set of colors that um, came to my mind when I was uh, researching um, this march. Uh, perhaps it's, ex it's um, exposing my own biases with, with it with colors. This is in, um, uh, uh, um, so I showed you just a few of the congressional districts. And so I'm gonna start showing you just a few pieces from the protests and marches series. Um, aesthetically, they, they look, um, they have a lot in common. There's a lot of um, themes within this work that I, re, I reuse over and over again um, and recontextualize certain themes. And one of those themes are, is the grid. Um, the grid was very, has always been very prominent within my work, and it's one of those elements that's necessary to define um, something as a map. Um, 
but now the grid is playing a much more stronger aesthetic role in this new work. And it no longer conforms to a grid, a typical map grid, because um, map grids you use uh, so you can find certain spots within the map, but these don't necessarily conform to that. And in this case, um, none of those uh, squares share the same lines. And you can see um, this route from Selma to Montgomery a lot of the squares are really, really small. Then they get, um, they progressively get larger and larger as you go farther and farther away from the, the march. So really quickly about the march, um, this runs around, um, um, uh, along a freeway. And right here on the very left side, you see that circle, which is kind of like an inset that is a small detail of um, the Edmund Pettus Bridge, which was where um, uh, the events of Bloody Sunday took place. And, um, you know, uh, there's, there's been a lot of um, attention towards, um, there's been a lot of um, talk of John Lewis of late since his passing and uh, the petition to change the name of Edmund Pettus, who was a, uh, um, a senator uh, who is also a grand um, KKK grandmaster, I believe. Um, so this petition is to change the bridge to the, jo um, uh, the John Lewis Bridge. Um, and so I thought it was really important to have that little insight. Um, but what I really wanted to get with this, because this, this march took about three days and they um, camped uh, two nights along the way and all of that happened, all of that, um, most, of the, most of that time frame took place after the events of Bloody Sunday. So that distance from the Edmund Pettus Bridge all the way to the end in Montgomery, um, I can only imagine the, the weight of, of the moment on you as you're going through this march. Um, a, very, very, a very different kind of weight as opposed to the previous piece with the Bataan Death March. Um, and I really wanted to try to capture that with this kind of descending um, grid where it starts off fairly large. And then as you get closer, you get smaller, smaller squares. But then as you get right up against the, the route of the protest, the, that, that grid, that square becomes skewed. Um, and the, the grid plays more than just, you know, referencing back to the map grid. They also start to take on um, characteristics of the grid that we see on the city, city blocks. Um, older cities that have blocks that are all crazy shaped um, because of the roads intersecting diagonally. And you see that with the blocks that are surrounding the march. Um, but then everything else is just this very typical square grid but they get larger and larger. And then um, when they get very much larger, they, some of them have a tendency to resemble rural areas. Um, this is the, the final piece I'm gonna show you and then um, we can open up for questions. Um, this, is the, this is the um, salt march. This is a representation, a piece based off of the salt march that was led by Gandhi in 1930. Um, so just a little background during um, the uh, uh, British occupation of um, India, one of the laws that was passed was um, a law making produ production of salt illegal. Um, and salt all had to be produced by um, a certain, a certain companies that were approved by the British company. So if you made salt, um, you know, you went to the ocean, get some salt water and made your own salt, you can be arrested for that. Um, and salt that was produced, um, that was for sale, were heavily taxed. And so that started the protest um, against uh, British rule. And it had started basically the beginning of the end of um, of um, uh, the British Empire, all boils down to salt, um, which is such a small 
insignificant thing. Um, and I was likening it to the events of the Boston Tea Party. Tea is a very small thing, but just like salt, its implication on the world is huge. And so the top, if you, the, the top of the march, oops, sorry. The top of the march or the, um, the start of the march starts at the top and the bottom, the, um, at the end of the march where it ends at the ocean where Gandhi makes salt is um, where the end. And it took about 24 days. They traveled 10 miles per day. So a total of around 240 miles. Um, hundreds, um, 60,000 people were arrested, over 100,000 people participated in and out. Um, the, the, the time I was making this, I was heavily, um, I was heavily into watching all the Black Lives Matters protests um, and the George Floyd protests. Um, and I remember seeing the large Black Lives Matter mural right in front of Lafayette Square in Washington, DC. And at the end, they had put th uh, two stripes with three yellow stars, which was um, based off of the um, flag of Washington, DC. And I wanted to incorporate some of that, um, especially that yellow, um, but maybe some of those stripes into this work because I started looking at these protests here um, that we're having right now within the lens of looking at the salt march. Um, all of those, so I included that in this border. I'm gonna show you just a really quick uh, detail so you can see um, this is near the end of the march, how everything is kind of put together. The, the shape of the landscape is not defined by me creating a border or anything. In that shape of the landscape is um, uh, dictated by where the square ends. So you can see there's no, that, that whiteness of the, the water kind of filters in into the grid. And each of these squares that could be part of that, you know, like just going back, referencing back that map grid has um, four different colors in them that are all randomly chosen. This piece has around 10,000 randomly chosen colors. Um, and mind you, all meticulously hand drawn with just little tiny markers um, to really push the, uh, the magnitude of this, this protest. Um, and on a side note, the distance from the, from one end of the march to another on the actual piece, um, I mean, the length of the piece is 78 inches. It's fairly, fairly, fairly long, but the distance between the beginning of the march and the end of the march is five feet, five inches, which was the um, height of Gandhi. Small in stature, but the overall effect of the piece is so large and heavy, just like the person. And there's so many references of the body in this, um, especially with the, the, the grid. Um, and even within the squares, you can see some squares, uh, there's an alternating pattern of squares that are very, very rigid that are um, drawn with a ruler and then other squares that are just hand drawn and it's somewhat organic. Um, and that was really trying to um, reflect the effect of this um, of this march, leading both to the independence of India and to the independence of Pakistan, which um, started uh, well, which um, where we are now, which ha we have this incredible conflict between these two countries that um, can eventually potentially um, lead to some sort of nuclear. Um, uh, retaliation between the two countries. Um, so the, just like with everything else in this, this whole story, start some, um, an event starting from something very small has very, very large results, which is, I suppose, the, both the, the beauty and the power of, um, of protest marches. All right. So I, I um, that was the last slide. I would, um, Christian. I think this is a good this is a good time to open it up for questions. Yeah, this is great. Um, thank you very much, Lori. That was that was really fantastic. Um, somebody noted in the chat, um, and I'm, I'm finding myself in a similar position. That uh, thank you for your very thoughtful 
um, explanations because almost every time that one of us had a question, we would give an answer. Oh, did, did. Good. <laughs> almost immediately. Oh, perfect. Um, <laughs> but I, I do want to go back to so Linda had a question. And I want to go back to this process before we dig into some of the content. Um, in you know these these works, one of the things that strikes me is um, how almost machine made that they they look and appear, um, which you noted had you know was sort of a, a tool you use to build confidence in the way that we have the same confidence in a map. You look at a map and you believe it. You know, we'll look at your work and we believe it, um, even though even if we it takes some time to decipher what we're believing. Can you talk uh, a little bit more about your process and what tools beyond the, the Coptic markers that you use and how much of this is freehand? How often are you just in the flow, you know, drawing these maps and uh, versus really plotting them out and collecting the data? Right. Um, when I'm, at, I'm in the drawing phase, it's all hand, I'm hand drawn and you can see like right here, my little set of rulers. Yeah. Um, so I, I very very low tech, but um, the the build up to actually actual drawing, it's really quite extensive with the digital. Um, so for example, with the uh, the Bataan Death March, you, you know you see how the the two um, uh, marches are on top of each other. Um, I would digitally uh, take them out from um, maps and then you know play around with the composition digitally. And once I have a good um, or a composition that I'm satisfied with, then I'll, I'll print it out um, and then kind of collage it all back together from, um, you know, these eight, eight by 10 uh, paper and very simple graphite on the back and then trace it right on top of the, the actual paper. So um, I'm trying to keep as accurate as I can to the scaling um, or the proportions of the map. Um, especially when I'm taking, um, uh, uh, employing real landforms. But when I'm, if I'm working for, on example, like an abstract piece that has, that has no actual source material that I need to accurately um, appropriate, then it's all hand, it's all you know free flowing, and rather painterly. Um, in its in the approach. So thinking about like uh, the United States series, which you started out the presentation with which are abstracted forms where you kind of, um, you added the four different new states. Um, by the way, I love the state of the internet, which I think has become its own country now. Yeah. Um, if, it, if it only it could be <laughs> governed in some other way. Um, right. When you're, when you're developing these new landscapes that are referential and they feel very familiar, they feel like I've, I've seen it before or it feels comfortable um, to live within that map. How are, how are you devising those new landscapes in, in shifting the boundaries of existing, you know, territories. Very good question because the um, I had mentioned before that I was uh, uh, using the the language of maps, the visual language of maps, and what that means is to be able to pick up certain recognizable elements within a map. Um, a, a good equivalent would be. Um, try to think of a of any language, um, you know, like let's say Spanish, and think about certain sounds that sound specifically Spanish, and then so when you hear those sounds again, you you would oh that's how I could recognize this language, without having to without having to know the language at all, right? Well, that that means that with uh, visual languages, if there's a very similar thing, then there are certain elements within maps that you can pick up, and then that's what would lead you to a map. That was actually one of the uh, interesting challenges with the small drawing series. Um, how far can I push the drawing where I'm no longer in map territory? And uh, basically, I'm not making any maps at all. Um, I, am, I make these are all drawings that employ um, the language of uh, maps or picking up on those recognizable bits. I do that same thing with landforms too. Um, so if I'm thinking about the United States, there are certain um, certain characteristics that the United States has that I am always employed with every version of the um, American map that I made. 
So for example, there's always going to be a peninsula. There's always going to be an east and west coast, um, a Great Lakes region, and then perhaps a, a country north and south of, uh, of us. So with those, uh, with those in place, then um, I could almost manipulate everything in between that and still somehow, hopefully, um, reference the United States or have it look like, and, and that's the key. When you look at a, a piece of artwork and you say, it looks like this, it looks like that to me. Um, that is, um, that's, that's, that, that's what I am trying to, um, not take advantage of, but to pinpoint and, and roll with. Very cool. Um, so sort of, sort of similar in a way, uh, Sarah's asking uh, that she recalls in your Fisherman's Wharf piece from the Stranger Hood series that um, you, you noted that the patterns that you chose were symbolic. Um, are patterns in your work generally chosen for their symbolic references in association with geography or is it more of just an aesthetic intent? Uh, intent? How, how do you land on these patterns? Because they, they're one of those things going back to the sort of familiarity that at least I get out of, of your work, you know, it makes me feel comfortable in this world that is chaotic and a little bit could be unsettling because it's like so familiar, but not. Um, how, do, how do you land on some of these patterns that you're uh, employing? Yeah, that, 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 was, that was very difficult to, to navigate when I was working on this series because um, it's so easy to choose patterns that perhaps my own sensibilities are particularly attracted to. Right. And if I uh, stuck to that, then I would end up with a series of patterns that perhaps may be too esoteric for anyone to relate to. Um, so I, that's why um, when I was taking on that role, uh, taking on the role of the stranger was so important with that, with that series because um, I, was, I was acting basically. I was trying to imagine myself this is my first time in Fisherman's Wharf. I'm walking the paths that um, uh, a tourist would walk. And so what are some of the things that they would see? Um, and I'm just, I'm, just the, um, I'm just the vehicle for that. And um, so I, kind of like with, with my rules, with being random, I try to stick to my, my, my my rules of logic that I've set up for myself. So when I'm walking down Fisherman's Wharf and I see a pattern on, let's say, a, um, a candy wrapper that's only there for, let's say, some promotional thing, I may be attracted to that pattern. It may look great aesthetically and in the map, but it's not congruent with what I'm, why I'm there for. Right. Right. I, I really like that idea, and it's going to make me revisit. Uh, how I examine the world around me because we do that we go into a new neighborhood or a new city and you find yourself taking pictures because you see a pattern that looks new or is going to be something you're going to associate there uh, but when you live in a place for so long you could become you take these things for granted very often um, and one of the things I, I did a talk we were having previously you and I uh, that the tiles on the sidewalks in the mission district are also part of the strangerhood series and I'd encourage everybody to go to Lordy's website and, and check out some more of his work there. Um, because I remember the first time I was in the Mission District being like, this is so cool, there's tiles on the sidewalk. And it's such a distinctive red and blue pattern if you've ever been to San Francisco um, that you start to take for granted over the years and you just hustle and bustle through. Um, so that's, that's really fascinating. That, so there's a lot of intent there in it feels like parameters and rules are something that you give yourself quite a bit. Can you talk about some of the rules or um, what makes up a map and how do you deploy those things or omit those things so that you can differentiate, differentiate your work as artwork or drawings instead of just as a map maker because you're, you're not creating tools that are useful for navigation in a, in a more literal sense. They're, they're tools for navigation in a more artistic exploration right the, uh, that's good the that's a good question the um, a lot of the rules of logic that I have differ from series to series um, 
usually when I'm, I'm kind of figuring it out, um, perhaps the first uh, couple of pieces or so, I'm still trying to figure out what those, what that rule of engagement um, are or is. Um, how that's devised over time um, just really, I think really depends on when I'm doing uh, research on maybe some of the larger themes. Um, so let's say with the protests um, and marches series um, and the gerrymander districts, um, before I started um, any of this work, I'm thinking about both of these in relationship to each other. And um, that's uh, kind of what I'm thinking, uh, how I'm understanding both of these, uh, uh, the material that I'm reading or, or watching at the time, because I, I like to do both. And also um, when it comes to um, the, the research, I also try to find information that's readily available to anyone. Um, so uh, what, there's a, another body of work where um, I was doing a lot of, uh, I was pulling a lot of imagery from the internet. And so if you would look at, um, like if you would Google one of the titles for um, from work from the, uh, like let's say I have a series called the Freeway Series, which you could see on my website. Um, if you look up any of those titles, um, you'd be able to find image uh, uh, in the Google image search and then find the exact image that I pulled from <laughs> for for the, uh, the, the work. So it's partly, it, when it comes to the research, it's partly it's, information that should be readily, that is readily available to anybody, but it's also um, research that I, I find along the way as I'm, I'm learning more and more. And then there's always this point um, of what to do with all the information and how to edit. And I suppose out of what comes out of that is the, the are these rules of logic. It's, it's a way to um, edit that information that I'm researching into a very palpable form, I suppose, for the audience. Um, I don't necessarily want to reinterpret or recontextualize this information, um, but um, perhaps I'm, um, the, the, re the resulting work is a reaction to that information. And so when I'm putting together these rules, um, that's, that's sort of the goal where, um, the, the, the combination between the source material and that relationship to my reaction to that source material is within a, a, a reasonable logic system that's, um, perhaps more understandable from the audience's point of view, if that makes sense. So I'm still, I'm still taking on that role as a cartographer, right? Because a cartographer is not going to overload their maps with all this unnecessary information that can hide what they're really trying to show. So that editing is super important. Yeah. I think that, um, you know, there's a lot of, and uh, there's a lot of, um, power in, and how intention is expressed from the artistic perspective or a cartographer or map maker's perspective as well. I guess this sort of leads into another question that we have coming in from Linda, which is how often do you have a, a finished vision when you sit down and you're like, okay, uh, I've looked at the, uh, the Bhutan death march and I've done a lot of research and I, I, wanna, I wanna be able to highlight these things. Do you have a clear vision of like what that finished piece looks like, even if there's a random generated you know feature built in um you know how much of it evolves on its own and uh, how much does the map inform you as much as you're informing what you're putting on the paper yeah it it it, it always seems to be um it feels like it's different <laughs> every time with a new piece but it I, actually when i look back it, it's always the same um i have a pretty good idea of what the piece is going to look like um, but then as I'm working, I'm still discovering things about the source material that I'm working with. Um, so, you know, perhaps I'll, um, uh, be influenced by some of that new information and make certain changes along the way. But there is a point where, 
uh, I'm committed, right? When the right. moment I make a dark line on a sheet of paper and it's, I can't, I can't fully erase. I could kind of erase parts of it, but I can't fully erase it. I am committed to a certain point. There are certain techniques that I've I've learned a way, uh, learned along the way to cover, um, uh, you know, cover any mistakes or any changes that I want to make. But it, it it is heavily limited. So it's it's really a combination of having um, a a vision of what this piece would look like and then leaving myself enough room to make changes along the way. Very cool. Um, we're getting pretty close to time here, but there's a really great question that came in that I really want to ask, um, especially thinking about the Nevada Museum of Arts, which, uh, Museum of Art, which has, uh, we have a large collection of land art holdings and archives. Um, and it's something that, you know, we, uh, we love diving deep, uh, deep on. Eva asks, do you identify with the land art movement or are you influenced by it? You're, there's, a, there's an aerial photography component to your work for sure. And there's geography is, you know, it's very much a part of that. How do, how do you relate to that movement and that, that idea? Great question. Um, I find myself very um, uh, lucky to be um, living in a period of art history that has so much in front of it. Land art is just one of them. Um, I would like to, I would like to imagine that art history is a buffet and I'm just picking things that um, work for my current work. Um, I mean, land art is definitely a heavy influence. Um, you know, Christian had mentioned earlier a lot of aerial photography. I'm just going to pull this out. It looks like I have a couple of books that I always have on reference and some of them are books like this, which is just aerial photographs of different, um, you know, different spots around the world, just so I could get um, ideas of landforms. Sorry, the reflection is bad, but there you go. Um, and how um, artists in the in um, in the past have um, uh, addressed um, the relationship between the artists and the land. Um, and I've definitely employed a lot of that in the work. Um, but then I, I pull from a whole bunch of other things too. Um, I pull from surrealism. I mean, um, one of the shows that um, I had, um, I think my show in New York uh, at Hospital Gallery there a couple years ago, the show was called The Map is Not the Territory, uh, which is coined by Alfred Korbisky, um, which is somewhat analogous to Rene Magritte's painting, The Image of the Treachery. Uh, this is not a pipe. It's right. a painting of a pipe. Right. And what I'm making is not a map. It's a drawing of a map, or it's a drawing that kind of looks like a map. Um, so I'll, I'll pull from there. I, I pull from minimalism. I mean, the grid is, um, it, it, it's a towering element in, in minimalism. Um, I, I'll pull from cubism. I, I pull from all these different movements, and um, I would. I, I think that almost a, a lot of artists that are working today um, um, at the the forefront of our industry would not would not you would not see examples of those artists in the past because I think that's something that we're all doing. We're all pulling from different parts of art history. Um, for a fully unique, um, singular, independent voice from one person. So it, it's, I think we're very lucky in that regard. Yeah, I would definitely agree that, you know, it's, it's amazing to have um, all these different move, movements and eras and points in, in art history to sort of reflect on and, and in many ways um, as congressional districts or maps change, our society has changed and um, this yeah. beautiful blended thing um, that really highlights the, the strengths of so many that have come before us. Um, so I'm gonna, we're gonna wrap up here. This is a, a very quick and easy last question from Sarah, uh, more of a technical question. Uh, what type of paper do you use? Is it a rag? Is it a cold press? Is it a hot press? 
how'd you land? What, what'd you find that works perfect with that alcohol-based ink? Right. Um, good question. Um, just so you know, uh, if you're going to use alcohol-based ink, uh, especially the Copics, Copic does make their own paper and it accepts the color beautifully. Um, it doesn't feather very much. The paper that I use is Stonehenge paper, which is a general printmaking paper. It does feather a lot. So a lot of the aesthetic elements that I have in my work are meant to hide that, hide that um, feathering. Sometimes I'll take advantage of it and use it um, as a visual element, but um, usually I end up trying to hide it with, um, with lines. Um, but um, th most of these papers would react, um, well, most of these thick uh, absorbent papers would react really well to using alcohol-based ink. Um, but one thing to know, or uh, if you're ever going to try this out, um, and if you wanted to have better control over the ink itself, if you uh, brush um, isopropyl alcohol, at least um, like an 80 to 90%, um, that kind of primes the paper to accept um, set, accept the ink uh, much better. Um, so when there's no when it's not treated, the ink will just feather out and out. But um, when the when it's been treated with a little bit of alcohol be, be in, uh, before, and you let it dry, when the when you apply the ink, it, it goes on the paper and it soaks through and then it stops. So you don't get much feathering. And you, if you um, the the Copic paper that you can buy it, uh, will kind of do that. So I don't know if they treat it that way. But the reason why I landed on Stonehenge is because um, you could buy it in rolls of um, 40, 42 inches wide by 10 yards at a time. And um, I, I like I like large drawings. And um, uh, you know I've done a couple of drawings where I put two sheets of paper to make it much larger. But I always found that crease, that, that line, to be distracting, so I don't use it very often unless I'm making a very large piece, like the um, like the Lake Tahoe like the Lake Tahoe piece I did um, um, that you guys commissioned me for. It was three very large panels of paper, but I couldn't find paper at that at that immense size um, when I was, was. I think it was like around twelve or something feet long. Um, if Copic made paper in rolls, I'd be using their paper. Well, maybe we can we can get the word to them. Uh, yeah, I, I I wish I could get to San Francisco to see this new show. As a reminder for anybody who's watching, it's in the Bay Area. We're going to be visiting the Bay Area. Uh, Polar Democracy opens today at the Hossfeld Gallery in San Francisco. Was that correct? Yes. And um, if I can just add, um, if you follow me on Instagram or um, visit my website, I'll be posting um, videos and updates and walkthroughs of the show. Um, also, um, I'll be talking about um, uh, certain choice pieces from the show um, in videos. So if you just keep an eye out for that on both Instagram and my website, um, then you'll be able to see some of those there. I highly recommend uh, Lordy's Instagram feed. You'll get to see his very cute <laughs> artwork, a lot of process shots, a lot of detail shots. That's at Lordy Rodriguez on Instagram. Um, Lordy, thank you so much again for being so generous with your time this week. Um, and on the educator evening that we hosted just the other evening and today as well. Um, I want to thank uh, Joanne Northrup, who curated In the Flow, which is on view through the end of the year at the Nevada Museum of Art. Uh, I think you can, I think we have five or six of your drawings on view right now. They're from the smaller series. They're really fantastic and I, I highly recommend it. It's a really good show overall. Um, I'd also like to thank Nevada Humanities for their generous support in making the Art Bite series happen, as well as the Core Humanities Program at the University of Nevada, Reno, which uh, provides free admission for students. Hope we have a few of you out there. Um, and thanks everybody for, for joining us. The next Art Bite is gonna be on November 6th with artist Edgar Heap of Birds. Um, and everybody have a great afternoon. Lordy, thanks again. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. It was great to see you guys again. Yeah, it's great to see you and really good talk. Same. Thanks, Bye everybody. Bye everybody.